And welcome to the Pipcast. I'm your host, Ray, the social media and PR manager for Pip Games. We're back for another episode of a new show to further show our support to the wider games and virtual reality industry. Last week, we chatted to Marty O'Donnell to chat about his career, goal, and what it's like working in VR. And today, we have another very special guest joining us. Please welcome the Chief Marketing Officer at Fast Travel Games, Mr. Andreas Julison. Thanks for joining us, Andreas. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me, Ray. I'm doing great. Thank you. Times, but uh, <laughs> really busy times for you over there. Really, you've got two games launched at the moment, right? It's, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. I know. I don't want to talk about it. But, yeah. <laughs> no, it's no, it's kidding. It's, <laughs> I mean, this, this is what we work for, really. I mean, you know, you prepare for years for these few weeks now. I'm, you know, I feel pretty comfortable. But uh, yeah, I do have a lot of work on my table at the moment. So, but I'm ha- so happy to be here to talk about this. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time because I know you, as you say, you've got loads on right now. So it's really appreciate it. And also happy Halloween. Uh, I know we just had a quick chat about it before the Pipcast, but uh, yeah. yeah, we were actually recording this on Halloween. So I uh, hope everyone out there is also enjoying their uh, their celebrations uh, this week as well. Cool. Yeah, Halloween is fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was always a good time of year, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on today's show, we're going to be looking at the incredible work Andreas and Fast Travel have been doing how they have an incredible busy 2019 ahead as we've just discussed with two game launches before the end of the year in addition to the VR game showcase that happened this year Apex Construct and much much more so as of last week this is going to be a very special show we're just going to dedicate this to to, as as mentioned to Fast Travel and all the work that they've been doing and to Andreas' work as well and we're going to kick that off and ask just ask you Andreas a bit about you how you got into the industry and kind of the journey to Fast Travel Games and your role as their Chief Marketing Officer Sure I mean it's uh I've been in a flat screen gaming industry, like you know, the traditional gaming industry for a little over fifteen years. Mm. And I've been around on, on different places like Dice and Bandai Namco and Vivendi the games before it became Activision Blizzard. So I had, you know, quite a vast experience uh doing marketing for for traditional gaming. I started to feel a bit like I did the same thing over again. I mean, even though it's a very vibrant industry and there's new technology and new innovations popping up all the time, a couple of years back now, actually almost exactly two years from today, wow. yeah, I made a jump into VR and it, it it basically started already while I was working at DICE with Battlefield games. And I got to try the very mm. first dev kit for Oculus Rift. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it was a mech game that I, I got to fly over a city in VR uh, in a big big ass robot basically um and it just blew me away and i you know the seed started to grow i think there and then and then a couple of years later or two years later or so i got to try the uh, the fish cage or the the shark cage thing on playstation vr at ah, an event yeah before it came out yeah. i threw my headset off i couldn't even you know i couldn't <laughs> stay for the shark to to because he's, he's opening the cage, yeah, he's making it so super vulnerable, and it, it was a really massive experience for me. And I think at that time, I felt like, shit, I, I have to work with this at some point in my career. And then, of course, the VR industry in Sweden has been booming quite a lot over the last few years. Fast travel games is one of many, one of the bigger ones, of course. And I think, you know, my my very biased opinion is that it's one of the best. <laughs> but uh, they also had, yeah, they also had a profile that that related uh, to me a lot. Uh, you know, focusing on story, immersion, world buildings, uh, narrative-driven games. So when they looked for a um, marketing and communications manager uh, in the summer of two. 2000, what is it now? Mm. 17? Yeah. Uh, I applied and I knew some of them from my time at DICE because the founders, they all have experience from DICE and, and places like Rovio and Avalanche. So, you know, I knew some of them and I knew uh, one of them in, in person as well. So I applied, uh, they picked me 
and I've been here now for two years uh, doing Brilliant. VR games marketing. Yeah, and it's a, you've been doing a fantastic job. We're going to deep dive a little bit about that as well because uh, you also represent other games and you've worked on other titles as well for, for, for yeah. you know, with other people. But we'll deep dive into that a little bit. But just to kind of look a bit more into your lure of VR, having worked at EA and uh, and Bandai Namco and play it and working on these massive franchises like Battlefield and Tekken. Yeah. And I guess what, 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 what the kind of the thing I want to get to is what are the main differences in promoting those kind of major massive intellectual properties that people know and love all over the world and then starting to make that transition into more fiercely independent games like an Apex Construct and a Curious Tale. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. It's also something actually, I've, I've written an article about this because it's quite a hefty topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think when you work with games like Battlefield or Mirror's Edge or even Star Wars Battlefront or, or for that sake Tekken, you know, you have, there's so many players from the previous games that are still actively playing that franchise. And that means that you have had years and years of uh, consumer insights and data gathering to sort of use and craft out your go-to-market plans for the next iteration. Mm. I mean, Tekken, Tekken, it was Tekken 7 that I worked with, which means that you know Tekken had been around for 20 years. The fighting genre on flat screen gaming had been around for even, even before home consoles. So... You know, you know so much already about the player preferences and the target audiences mm. when you craft out your marketing plans. In VR games today, uh, especially two years ago, VR had only been around for a year, a year and a half before we announced Apex Construct. You know, honestly, we didn't know much about any target audience in VR at that point. And I guess at some, to some extent, we still yeah. don't because it's such a new medium. It's three and a half years in now on the home console, home VR uh, headset market. And um, it's an era of experimenting and trying to learn as you go that I feel is really, really exciting. So what you can do, of course, is to learn from your own game releases, which is why I think it's critical to release one game so that you have done the full cycle of announcement and pre-launch and launch and post-launch and data insights gathering and use all that for your next games. That, that's critical at this point. And everyone is just trying things. There's no one who really knows what the next big thing will be in VR. There's no genre fatigue yet happening. You start to see sequels now, but it's just a few of them so far. So it's a very, it's a very young and uh, a bit naive part uh, of the VR gaming industry that I you know, I love because I can use my vast experience uh, from the traditional gaming industry, uh, but I can also feel this child inside me, you know, being curious and trying things and see what works and what doesn't work and maybe be the pioneer in some kind of marketing initiatives that no one has done before in VR gaming. So it's a mix that I, I really, really enjoy at the moment. Yeah, and I suppose that's quite an interesting point because talking a bit about VR um, and like how you're saying it's, it is still very young at this point and it's still emerging as a technology. But when do you feel that it's going to be that VR as a medium is going to be regarded as established now uh, i mean how far away are we from that and when it is established i mean what kind of experiences do you think we could expect from it then yeah it's it's a really good i mean it's a question of definition i guess yeah when it's established when it's going you know for lack of better words when it's going mainstream those are the questions that everyone keeps asking now when mm. will when will vr gaming be what smartphones did for mobile phones for example it's safe to say that you know the initial hype in vr in 2016 a lot of experts said that this is going to overtake traditional gaming. This is the future of gaming. I think we can be be honest and humble and say, uh, you know, it, it didn't go as fast as mm. we thought back then. And it probably won't be the case of VR replacing something. From my perspective, it has a natural role in gaming alongside the traditional gaming or mobile phone gaming as well. You know, streaming is, is coming up now as well for, for multi-screen uses. And, and it, you know, all these things can coexist. So it, it's not necessarily a, a question of VR taking over. But I do think that the important steps towards or mass appeal of VR has been taking this year, especially with the launch of Oculus Quest. And, you know, you can say also the other headsets that have removed the need for like external cameras and external power units, making VR more accessible. It's basically a plug and play headset now, similar to a smartphone or a or Nintendo Switch, for mm. example, which is critical, I'd say, to make VR into something bigger uh, than yeah. catering for the core audience. So, uh, you know, there are steps taken all the time. We as developers try to make the experiences you know, that the people cannot be without. 
so that there is there are reasons to actually go into VR outside of the VR experience itself. I mean, you know, there are rumors about Half-Life 3, etc. And we try to games that are so good now in VR exclusively that that you know traditional gamers would say, okay, this is the time for me to to enter VR game because it's there's so much so many reasons for us to to engage in VR today. And we didn't see it two years ago, but now VR is accessible. It's relatively it's a bit cheaper than it used to be as well. There are more games, there's a higher quality of games, all these steps in in tandem mm. I think will make VR, you know, at some at some point it, there will be sort of a main mass market or mainstream appeal to VR as well. And, and we're getting there. To, to be honest, we, we haven't really seen even even 10 million units of VR home gaming headsets being so live to date across all the headset platforms. So it's still a relatively small market. PlayStation 4 has sold, what is it now, 100 million units, become the second best uh, selling console of all time. Yeah, incredible. Last, last week. Yeah, it's incredible. And we know that last the last you know figures that PlayStation revealed for PlayStation VR was 4.2 million headsets sold this spring. So, yeah. you know, we're getting there, but it'll, it will take some time. What we can do in the meantime is just make awesome experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, as games developers. I think you're right. I think PlayStation, if, if VR is going to hit the mainstream, I feel like PlayStation will probably lead the way with that as, as the current market leader in VR. Yeah. Having said that, there are big, ch- obviously Quest has come out now and that's changed the game a lot as well, as we've mentioned. And, you know, Oculus is getting more affordable and, you know, there's, there's lots of different dynamics to play at the moment. So as you say, I think mainstream is coming closer at hand, but it, it's still still a way to go for sure but i suppose that sort of talks a bit about fast travel games because obviously you've chosen uh vr as your specialized for your product and uh so when you look at how a company like fast travel is formed mm-hmm. uh and and then you look at your sort of career trajectory and moving into that i mean when did you feel obviously i know you talked a bit about how you played some of the early prototypes of vr but when did you feel that you know vr was was the medium that you wanted to work in and, and felt like this was the future for you in the games industry? I mean, I, I got to try a, an early version of Apex Construct during my uh, application process for fast travel, for example. And of, of course, at that point, I have already decided to, mm. to join the industry at some point, but um, I didn't realize it was going to be so cause of, cause quickly for me. But I think that the games that Apex Construct is and other games that really puts the player into a different place. I remember a game that I played before applying for the role of fast travel called Dread Halls, which is a, a horror game. <laughs> and I, I'm a huge horror games fan. I, I played I played most horror games on the traditional games uh, segment, but uh, in VR, what happened to me was that I actually I was actually afraid of dying for real for the first time in my life. <laughs> 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 yeah, I had a moment in that game where I just couldn't take it anymore. I just had to throw myself on the couch and through the headset on the other side of the room and say, no, no, that's it. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I loved that every second of it. And I, it made me convinced that we can deliver emotions in VR that mm. can't be delivered in flat screen gaming. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, you know, death anxiety. It can be, you know, fun and smiles and a sense of wonder and a sense of curiosity to reveal something or, or explore something. There are so many more senses triggered when you play VR. And I felt like a child again, you know, going, trying out VR properly, especially first person games, which is like where I think VR comes to its natural uh, state, really where you are yourself in a world and you can hmm. walk around and you can feel things and touch things and interact with things. And it's it's just such a believability that you're actually doing this yourself. So yeah, it, it, it grew on me from the moment I played the shark cage, yeah. when I played Dread Halls, when I tried Apex Construct, it just kept convincing me that I have to be, I have to do this. It's too good to pass up on I think and I, I you know it's too exciting not to work with and see what we can do with that's, it that's quite interesting as well because uh, you've uh, a lot of people say that you need to play VR in order to kind of truly understand VR and I, and I absolutely believe that's true I feel like you, you can you can read as many articles as you like you can watch as many videos as you like um, yeah. and I suppose that's an interesting point as a marketer how do you kind of get that across to people and how do you kind of promote those sort of products and really sort of get people invested into a product 
who maybe don't own a VR headset, how how do you get people on board with with an Apex console? Yeah, I think I think there is a distinction here to be made if you are trying to market a VR game or a VR headset. Just many people tend to forget sometimes. We as VR games developer, our primary focus is not to convince people about VR, it's to convince the VR audience about our product. So for us, it's not a case of having to sell the whole experience of VR. I mean, that that absolutely helps and can attract interest in our product. And that's being done now with, you know, integration of uh, things like Live or Mixed Cast, where we can actually make pretty awesome trailers for our games, where you see a real human being inside the game, you know, wa- waving or jumping or shooting and stuff. That's, that's you know, that that creates exciting content for online usage but our target audience for our games are primarily almost exclusively i would say the owners of vr headsets Mm. and they know what we vr is and isn't and they are already sold on the actual vr experience so we don't have to off most most of the time we don't have to convince them that vr is fantastic they know that if you are a vr headset manufacturer on the other hand your primary audience is of course the people who, who haven't yet acquired a vr headset and they i think they are in the toughest position where you have to use things like you know event consumer events or mm. there was a marketing beat that that uh, Sony did in uh, in North America last year, where they sent out three thousand headsets, I believe, to PlayStation Plus owners who could apply nice. to get get the PSVR headset home for a month, try it out. If they wanted to keep it, they can buy it for half the price, or they can send it back, and then they send it out to three thousand new players. So you know, it's 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 a very complicated marketing initiative because there's a lot of post postage uh, well, and, and man, manhandling. Yeah, a lot of logistics. <laughs> <laughs> but but it also says something about the challenge, yeah? That, mm. you know, the only way to really convince something about VR is to put them inside a VR headset. Yeah. Um, so definitely a challenge, but more so for the VR headset developers than game developers, I would say. No, I agree with you. I feel like, as you say, you you know your audience and your audience knows you and what to expect from you. And uh, I feel like that's that just grows as, as people purchase more headsets. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge because I feel like with VR, you have to, you really really have to experience that yourself to understand and, and get a feel for you know what what you're actually getting yourself into especially with horror games as you said because i mean that for me was the real turning point for me i think when i first got into a horror game and uh oh, yeah. just played resident evil 7 yeah, i've no. never felt attention like it <laughs> yeah man, and then, i mean ease of use for a vr headset will absolutely make sure that more people try vr because you know when you have a headset that you can just place on a friend's head they are five minutes away from being inside a vr experience that makes it so much easier for this sort of ring effect of people you know showing it to their friends letting friends and family members play or even bringing vr to other places outside of your own home so having untethered headsets or or at least headsets that are quick to get into the experience that does a lot for vr to grow in small circles here and there it's quite so, funny actually i was chatting to yeah. i don't know if i don't know if you know gamertag vr yeah, uh, I do. the, I the do. youtuber yeah so i was chatting to him at egx this year and he, he said jokingly in passing that he felt like he should have brought his oculus quest with him so he could just demo it to people on the show floor exactly just 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 literally just hand it up to someone here have a give this a try see what you think yeah i should have i should have <laughs> and it, it's, a, it's a funny thing but that that's the kind of thing that you need to do to kind of get people to to just understand it and play it yeah. and just because uh, a lot, there, there's a lot of opportunities to play VR at a showcase like an EGX, but people tend to shy away from it, or they don't necessarily go to it because they've always want to go to play the Final Fantasy VII remake. Yeah, exactly. Or go and see what's happening with Cyberpunk, you know, and they don't feel like they make the time yeah. for that. So it's it's so important to get that kind of hands-on experience on to really get people in, in, attuned to it. Yeah, I mean, for us as games developers, you know, as if if the VR audience grows, it also means that we can put more resources and money into making better and bigger games because initially you saw some studios going big and wide with VR just to realize that oh wait there's no market for this hmm. so they closed down i mean there's a studio called CCP in in iceland who i think they put tons of uh, well you know tens and tens of people on into VR very early on and try to be something hmm really really cool for vr i i I love that they embraced vr at that like that but it but it it just wasn't ready the market wasn't ready at that point so Mm. you know for us we need more people to acquire a vr headset 
that's when we can make longer games, which is always being asked for and requested by players. Bigger games, more open world, you know, more just basically higher production value across the board. But we can't we can't do that yeah. uh, unless the VR market grows. That's just the core reality of it right now. So yeah. we're all in this together, really. Yeah. To make it it get, I hope I think we're getting there. I definitely think we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I suppose that, that that moves us naturally on to your first major project, Apex Construct with Fast Travel Games. And uh, what you set out to do is create an all new intellectual property in like a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, there was an emphasis on combat using bow and arrows. And so I just wanted to, like, because obviously you were involved with Fast Travel in the, the early days of Apex Construct. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about the conceptual stages of the game. Uh, I imagine it, I, I, you know, it was always intended to be a VR project, but, um, you know, and what made it the natural fit for VR and how much of a challenge was it to create something new and different when it was a very early title and there wasn't a lot to compare it to? Yeah, I think I think we actually were also guilty of over scoping a bit. <laughs> I think when it comes to you know the the, the core vision that uh, Eric, our creative director, had for the game, it's still very much true in the final product. But I also think that we, given the, the state that the VR gaming industry was in at the moment and the fact that it it calmed down quite a bit from the early first six eight months on the market for for uh, the first few headsets coming out. I think Apex, Con- Apex Construct initially was planned to be a bigger game, uh, more interconnected levels, a little bit more Metroidvania segments in the game. So, uh, but the, the core experience stayed mm. true, of course, through the, through the whole process of, of making it and releasing it. And we set out quite early to make something truly believable. Like we, we really wanted a stylized world that that wasn't using any tropes or any, you know, there, there's a bunch of great games out there, but we didn't want to make a game with zombies or, or horror. We wanted to make something unique, a unique environment that was made exclusively for this game that you hadn't seen before, like, but a world that you really felt, oh, I have to travel there and, and explore it. So the post-apocalyptic Stockholm became the setting for the game, um, but it's still it's still a very colorful game, even though there are no humans anymore and, and buildings are torn and shifted. There it's still very colorful and calm and quiet in some areas. So that was one thing we wanted to do. And then we felt that uh, you know using a bow in VR was awesomely fun. So we decided quite early on that the bow and the shield combination that you have, because you have a bow and shield combination, you can shield yourself from projectiles, but the bow was really integral for the game. Yeah. And we spent a lot of time you know, fine-tuning the bow mechanics in the game. It's not a traditional bow, it's a cyber bow with different arrow types and all that, but, but we're really, really proud of how that came uh, came to life in the game. And, uh, and lastly, I'd say our focus is very much on story, characters, and world building. Mm. And we wanted to create a story it say something in the game if you are you know uh, a completionist there's a lot of lore to find in the game about the background story and what happened and between the different companies who yeah. created these ais back in the days and what actually happened to the world so um that's also something we felt at that time point and i still think it's the case it we felt it was lacking in vr a proper narrative driven experience with something to say more than just here's a setting here's are some enemies mm. there's the bad yeah. guy go kill them so yeah that's that's how it came to be a big point you've mentioned there is how there was the narrative vision in vr was still a little bit lacking at the point of the release of apex construct i think since then it's obviously grown quite exponentially and i feel like your game has has helped influence that in many ways because uh you know it was at the early doors of vr and it was one of those early experiences that people got to you know attach to and got used to with that yeah the amazing thing i found with apex construct as well perhaps more so than many other releases on the market is how much support it has received post launch and how it gradually brought it out onto every format so it's accessible to no matter which headset you own you can get hold of apex construct yes uh and obviously there you've, you we work together to produce the physical release of the game on playstation vr yeah. as you've patched the game extensively over time listening to feedback obviously you, of course you created the signia cup challenge so i mean how important was it to you and to fast travel games to keep making updates for apex construct and i guess what at what point do you stop and say okay we need to stop now and actually focus on the next one <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's true that we have been supporting the game maybe for a little bit too long, but it, it's, a, it's a good thing. No? <laughs> it is a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. It's also, I mean, it's it's part. I would say that we felt early on that you know, in order to become eventually sometime in the future 
the world's leading VR games developer, which is our modest goal. Mm. It'll take some time. But in order to do that, we have to understand everything about VR games development. We have to understand its audience and what to do and not to do. So updating Apex Construct post-launch wasn't only fan service or you know listening to the communities. It was well, it was that, but the reason was also for us to learn about making post-launch content. Uh, what kind of updates are necessary that we can implement ahead of time for our next game instead? Like we made a lot of tweaks to the locomotion and to the bow features in the game that we absolutely have now, will be using now as a default for upcoming similar first person games like Apex. Mm. I also think that it's in order to understand, and for me as a marketer, for in order to understand, fully understand VR gamers today, you have to be present on places like Reddit or the Facebook groups or even social media or forums and listen to what everyone says. And I, I, I found out quite early that there was a lot of appreciation coming from the VR games communities when a developer like us showed up and really listened and replied and honestly, transparently said what we felt about things. And and it was just a you know give and take relationship that I I haven't seen that strong in traditional gaming for a long, long time. But v- the VR gaming audience are very engaged and very passionate and they understand that, you know, us developers, we are not big companies like EA. Mm. We don't have a thousand employees. We're usually around ten. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And we're we're passionate people as well. So they have the chance to talk directly to us and we have the chance to listen directly to them. And yeah, it's it's I, I I've enjoyed so much. And I that's why I still spend a lot of time talking and listening on on well all touch points in the ecosystem really to show my support for the communities and really get their knowledge so that we can keep making better and better games going forward yeah you've talked about your ambitions as a studio there and talking a bit about apex as well like you recently released it on quest and it's now the best-selling version of the game which is incredible to think after a year and a half after launch yeah that's incredible yeah it's crazy congratulations to that i mean that that's amazing the games get to see new audiences and uh, you know they get to reach people who've never played the game before people who've double dipped and bought it again just to get it on quest it's incredible and i guess what does that say about about your ambitions as a studio because you've talked a bit about how much you've, you've enjoyed supporting Apex Constructs and obviously you're moving on to new games now which we'll talk about shortly but mm-hmm. you've obviously set almost a barrier of expectation in some ways uh, mm-hmm. with the amount of support that you've, you've you've offered with Apex but as fast travel continues to grow and as you create more projects I mean do, do you feel that's a feasible thing for you to achieve with with with, with more games as you keep releasing them can, can you keep supporting them to the same level I think so I mean we are not trying to make too many games at the same time. The fact that we have two games coming out this Christmas, well, in November and December, is more of a, um, I say, an exclusive event of things. The, you know, the Curious Tale of Stolen Pets, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit later, is is a smaller passion project from a from a dedicated team inside Fast Travel. And then Body Cuts Two is is the other uh, people in the studio making that game together with another company. Uh, but going forward, our focus is still to to remain focused on what we do and not do anything half assed So yeah. if we make a game, we will believe in that game all the way and we will absolutely support it post-launch as well. That's the same thing with Curious Tale now. I think if it, if it takes off and there's demand for fixes or content, etc., we will absolutely listen to the fans. We're, we're, we're equipped to do that, uh, I would say. Oh, a lot of us have worked with the games that have strong post-launch engagement, like Battlefield or... Mm. Uh, Star Wars Tekken. games, yeah, yeah, yeah Tekken as well. So we kn- we know that you know the days of uh, Fire and Forget game releases are <laughs> usually they're not here anymore, really. Mm. So absolutely, yeah. it's it's part of our philo- philosophy to slowly grow into becoming one of the you know best VR game studios in the world is to be transparent, be out there and be open with open ears to the VR players. I think that's one of the things I love most about Fast Travel is the fact that you do do that and you, you're very you, you're, you're very active. As I say, you, you've, you've talked about social media, you're very, very active online and you're always listening, always responding. Uh, there's always something happening with Fast Travel games, which is always exciting to me to read that and see your continued growth <laughs> and progress as a studio. So really happy to see that and I'm great to, excited to chat about your new projects very soon. But I just wanted to chat about 
about your personal ambitions as well, because uh, obviously we've mentioned how Apex Contract was such a huge debut for your studio, but your personal ambitions don't just extend to sort of marketing your own games and Fast Travel's own games, yeah. but also celebrating other people's games in VR. Uh, and earlier this year, I know that w- an idea that you'd been brewing for many years came to life with the VR game showcase at Gamescom. And I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, wh- where those ideas came from, how it all came about, what your hopes and expectations were, and would you want to do something like that again? Yeah, absolutely. And this this is really, I mean, if The Curious Tale was a passion project from uh, uh, our senior animator, James Hunt, and his team, making you know sure that, for example, the VR Games Showcase was a a uh, heartwarming passion product of myself from a marketing perspective. And it's, it's true that, you know, I've, I've been, as I mentioned before, I have a long history in traditional gaming industry and you rarely see studios working together or helping each other out. It's, it's, it's very us against them. And it's not like they're enemies. It's just the fact that, yeah. you know, that's not the nature of the industry uh, anymore. So especially from, you know, indie studios, absolutely. But the bigger studios, they just don't do that. And I, I felt last year when I started to think about, you know, ways to use my marketing expertise and benefit from it for fast travel, but also making sure that the VR games industry could benefit from it as well. I came to realize that at this point in time, we have so much more to win on working together than working against each other. At some point in time, we will definitely be enemies. You know, there will, there will be there will be times where we're you know won't say hi to each other in the event halls Crossing or whatever. Swords. But exactly, well, that's year, still years away. And most studios today, like us, we don't have many much resources. I mean, you know, game sales are not sufficient to just to only game sales are not sufficient to survive as a studio today, uh, which means that most studios don't have any massive amount of marketing budget or, or even manpower or time to do a bigger impact initiative by themselves. So long story short, I created the concept of the VR Games Showcase last winter. And in, in short, what it meant was that I felt that there was a way for smaller VR gaming studios or medium-sized like us to participate in the bigger gaming events of the world. Uh, If we combine efforts and shared costs, we could potentially go to places like Gamescom and deliver something unique, exciting for media and, you know, the industry people like content creators. So I started reaching out to a bunch of different studios and eventually... It was us and five other studios. We had Servios, uh, Resolution Games, Cortopia Studios, Carbon Studios, and Neat Corporation. You know, the six of us decided to, let's try to make something really cool for Gamescom together. Let's try to create a VR Games showcase, a massive booth where we can share expertise, share costs, share, you know, communication uh, channels that we had with media and content creators. And it all turned out so fantastic, I would say. Uh, were three full days of uh, media and uh, YouTubers coming there and trying out all the studio's upcoming games, exclusive content from them. Yeah. They got to meet and greet with the developers. Yeah, and I, I yeah, it, it was by far the most fun week I've had in my very long career uh, in video games. And I, you know, luckily as well, I would say, because it's quite expensive to do these kind of initiatives, uh, we went on a search for sponsors to help us out, help make this happen. And uh, of course, you guys, Perp, Perp Games, came in as our, our sponsor and, and made sure that we could deliver the, the top-notch quality that we really felt the uh, initiative deserved. So that happened in, in, uh, in August this summer. First time ever uh, that kind of collaboration took place. And uh, we are already talking about what to do next, basically, for 2020. No. And it, there's a massive interest in the VR games showcase concept. We had a bunch of studios coming, uh, coming to me afterwards and saying, oh, we have to join as well. Yeah. Please, can you keep us informed you know, about your plans for 2020? So right now, I'm very short-term focused with our upcoming two games, but uh, we will definitely, I would say, bring the VR Game Showcase to uh, one or more events in 2020. That's really exciting. I'm so glad that that's grown into, hopefully, a permanent fixture uh, going forward, because they say that it's so difficult for VR games on, on their own to get that kind of coverage. I mean, who knows, maybe in five, ten years' time, that won't be the case. Yeah. But certainly at the moment, it is a challenge to do that individually and so what you've sort of cultivated there is an environment for uh, people to 
playing one or more games, which I think, as you say, is important for, to that ecosystem of VR development to really kind of flourish and grow for, for, for the, to, to the position where we want it yeah, to grow Yeah, absolutely. To. And, uh, you know, it, it is a question of money, of course. We, we couldn't go to Gamescom ourselves. Now we could because of this initiative. So it's just a fact of making these dreams happen in the, the best way possible. And this, this was the way. And it, it's, this is just one of the ideas I have now for, you know, marketing in VR games that I think we also did the fir- world's first YouTuber uh, gathering in Stockholm with Apex Construct, for example, the first time that the dedicated VR gaming YouTubers uh, got to meet each other in real life. Nice. It's it's initiatives like this just to make sure that we bring the uh, marketing and communication aspect of the VR gaming industry to the same level as the uh, the best class games available. So yeah, it's nice that you've kind of taken almost taken it upon yourself to become uh, an evangelist for the industry and kind of you know represent uh, support the medium by doing these talks, appearing on podcasts like this. You know, taking the time to be a, a judge at the award show and you've kind of seen your role in VR grow as a result of that uh, almost become something of an, an influencer to so to speak the people uh, yeah, that they know that how affiliated you are with it and uh, you know they, they know that the work that you're doing is is all in favor of, of, of growing the industry as a whole so it's uh, it's it's really important to have people like yourself step up and, and uh, use your experience to kind of benefit the whole ecosystem so to cool yeah no I, I appreciate you saying that it's it's good to get that kind of recognition of course but it's, it's it's also, you know, I, I do have, from time to time, I actually do have the time to think a little bit outside the box and think a little bit outside of our own game releases and to what, how to position fast travel games as the marketing expert studio as well. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens 2020. But I, I, there will be some exciting things happening, I think. And the fact that most studios don't really have a full-time marketing person like myself is also something that we have to, you know, understand today. Uh, that's also why there is such a need for someone like myself or, uh, you know, a similar person yeah. to, to yeah. push things forward and get everyone else to join in on the initiatives because most couldn't do it by themselves, even if they wanted yeah. to. Yeah, no, that, that that that's absolutely true. As you say, it, it's still at that early stages, and you know, people literally have the development cost to create the art, to create the music, and that's basically all they have the budget for. They don't have necessarily the, the budget to hire someone who's a marketing professional. Yeah. It's so important. And I suppose that sort of leads me on to talking about one of your two new projects you've got coming up, because it's actually a collaborative project uh, with Neat Corporation, who created the original budget cut. Uh, so I just wanted to find out how this collaboration came about to create budget cut too, which is obviously a very, it's an adored franchise in VR already and people are very excited to see the sequel. Uh, so it's like, how, why are you both developing the game and what are sort of the main differences from the original budget cuts? How have Fast Travel really uh, contributed to that? Yeah, it's it's quite an interesting and a very natural story, really. We, we used to share offices in Stockholm. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah, when we both both started up our companies, we, we shared offices in the old town of Stockholm, back in the days, really, and, and you know, got to know, know each other. The, our CEO and the Neat Corporation CEO knew each other from before as well. And we sat in the same office. It was like an, a, you know, an open office space, really. So we talked a lot and we used to share ideas between the studios. And wouldn't this be cool to do in, in Body Cuts? Or wouldn't that be cool to do in Apex Construct? Stuff like that. So this just, I think, just grew on us. Mm. And after the success of Body Cuts 1, Neat Corporation were like hot and brimming of keep working on the franchise and really wanted to do keep the story going in the game. And we basically just say, why don't we do it together? <laughs> you know, we have a lot of experience in storytelling uh, and, you know, world building. We have some really experienced uh, technical skilled uh, developers. We have, a, you know, I, Eric, our creative director, who's writing the script for the sequel, is uh, he's he was leading development for uh, Mirror's Edge 2 yeah. uh, or Mirror's Edge Catalyst at DICE, for example. So we had so much experience expertise and we felt this this could really fit into the body cuts franchise and neat yeah they just they love the idea and you know from that friendship relationship that we had we decided that let's let's do this let's share resources and and make an even better sequel than we initially had planned to do really <laughs> so um you know the Bodycast 2, it's called Bodycast 2 Mission Insolvency. 
and it's coming out on December 12. I, it is a uh, continuation on the first game. So in the first game, of course, you were basically sneaking and hiding in, in uh, the office space environments from these robots who had taken over the existence of humans, really, and replaced them with robots. So there was no need for humans anymore. <laughs> you, you, you played a very passive, or not, not, maybe not passive, but you played a cautious role in the game. So you, you, should, you should basically stay away from danger and uh, use the air vents or hide behind doors, etc take the robots down in a sneaky way so for yeah. the sequel now the story is picking up where the first game left off so if you play body cuts one you will sort of get a conclusion to the story without making any spoilers but it's also it also works as a standalone story so if you complete the new to the game you can jump straight into it and enjoy it just as much basically and we're this time we're taking the player out from the the office space areas in the first game, and uh, we're offering more dynamic and diverse environments, more vertical environments. So, for example, you'll be standing on a moving train, and you can jump in and up on the roof, and in inside the train wagons, or you're in the city, and you can you know travel between the balconies on a on a high skyscraper and to the rooftops. And there's a lot more variety when it comes to environments in the game. And of course, as a proper sequel, if we add more enemy types, more gadgets. Um, there's also a bow weapon this time around. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which is really cool. You can fire like, you know, you can fire tacos or you can fire arrows, whatever you decide <laughs> to do. Um, it, um, but, but the most important thing I would say is it, it has kept the style and tone and the unique sort of tongue-in-cheek humor that made the first game such a unique masterpiece. Mm. Um, I would like to say also that, you know, the, the launch of Body Cuts 1, uh, Body Cuts 1, there was a lot of improvement needed early on on the game when it came out. Uh, there were some bugs reported from players that Neat had to work a lot on, on fixing for the game. So this time around, we have a closed beta. Both studios are working tirelessly on quality assurance to make sure that you know when the game is out, December 12th, it will be a top-notch experience from the first day. So we're super excited about this sequel. I played it and I yeah I can't wait to jump just jump back into that unique weird universe. Yeah, didn't didn't you all have like a development day at the studio where you all played it from start to finish? I, I think I saw a tweet from that from you recently. Yeah, we did, we did. Everyone played it, <laughs> literally everyone. <laughs> so and it's 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 uh, it you know it's quite a long game. So you you know most of us weren't able to finish it that <laughs> that day. Only the people who had been playing it for a long time and knew mm. knew exactly where to go and what to do. I think they they might have been able to. I, I came halfway that day, I think. So it's uh, it's still you know that single play narrative driven game that takes you from levels and missions, and you get to explore and find your own way. Basically, I wanted to come back to what you mentioned about a beta for the game, and uh, it is quite a unique approach to development for a single player game, and especially for a VR game at this stage, because I mean that's ma- mainly for multiplayer games. I find, yeah. And so, what sort of things you want to try and accomplish with the beta, and how challenging is it to build a game that fits with sort of fast travels ethos to development, or remaining faithful to the sort of game? the audiences loved in the original the beta is really is is resonating a lot with our approach to listening to the community so the beta just just to be clear this beta is only for quality assurance purposes what Mm -hmm. we're doing is we're making the full game available to a very small group of dedicated players really uh, who we are relying on as well partly to uh, report to us what they find and what they experience. Mm. And we do this beta with quite good lead times ahead of launch as well, so we can digest the reports and make sure to fix whatever comes up that we haven't thought of ourselves. Yeah. So so the beta really is, is I would say, it's, an effect, it's, it's a result of us this time focusing more heavily on delivering that top-notch game at launch, making sure that we have thought of everything because quality assurance, you can you can play for hours, hours or days by yourself, but there's always new stuff to find. There's all, there are always some bugs that you haven't thought about. So just getting external players who haven't played the game before to actually play the game and report to us will, will help us a lot to to fine tune the game for launch yeah it's so important to have that feedback externally because you can see the same environments again and again day after day and and also it's also good to have that outside perspective like people think of things that you, perhaps you hadn't thought of to try or things to do that are, are quite different to approach to how your development team would approach that so it's so important to have that feedback i agree it's an interesting point for vr now because it's approaching a period where we're starting to see sequels to games now obviously we've got budget cuts 2 there yeah. was an earth in mars 
Cars 2 last year. We've got Pixar at 1995 coming up next year. And one can say that VR is starting to get its own major recognisable franchises now. Mm -hmm. And it's so natural to see that develop yes. and grow. But how important is that kind of growth at this early stage? And what role do those sequels have in bringing even more people to VR? Or is there perhaps a risk of alienating people who feel a bit intimidated by jumping into a sequel as opposed to uh, a, a new intellectual property? Well, I think first and foremost, I hope that all of these sequels that you mentioned and, and every other sequel is a better <laughs> is a better game than the first game because if that's the case, it means that the, the bar is being raised a bit now when it comes to VR games quality, mm. which is always a good thing for everyone, even non-VR players. If, if, if that bar keeps being pushed and game quality is being raised year and year and year, it's, it's for the greater good of, of VR, yeah, I would say. Absolutely. And just the fact that developers can look at what they did with a game, everything they did right, what didn't really work out, some of the things they shouldn't have done, and packing this together into a new game, I think it's just, it's, it's highly important. Because it, it has been a bit of a hit and miss or just shoot from the hip industry for a few years now where people are trying things. And even even the great titles out there, I would say, are there's a few aspects on there. It's like, what, what did they think about? How, how could they have done this? So sequels will, will make sure that, that the game quality is being improved upon, which is great. And I also think that we do need the recognizable brands so that there is something, some kind of history to talk about, some kind of universe to research and digest and understand. It's not just scattered pieces of yeah. experiences from here and there. It's actually some, some kind of story that sticks and becomes one with VR. I mean, Body Cuts had a demo in 2016. That's one of the reasons why it's become one of the most loved games in this VR era, I would say. The first game has sold relatively well as well, so that definitely deserves its own place uh, as one of the true VR uh, origin games. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about sequels as long as we keep trying and innovating things and that's yeah. not just fine-tuning but that's i think we're we're still years away from having buddy cuts seven <laughs> so there, but hopefully it is in the way ho hopefully <laughs> but you know until then we'll still see innovation matched with the fine-tuning to make vr gaming an even better thing for all players so that sort of leads us naturally on to your other project that you're working on a self-developed project this time uh, the curious tale of stolen pets and again this is such a huge departure from apex construct in more ways than one. But obviously, <laughs> it's it's again, it's it's another self-contained IP, and you've obviously got one well-known developed IP already in the bag with the, with fast travel games in Apex. But what are the risks of doing something new yet again? Uh, not necessarily just deciding immediately, right? Let's do Apex Construct Two to capitalize on that. Yeah. But what what are the risks of doing something new, but also so massively different? So I mean, do, do you want to just kind of cultivate an environment where like people don't necessarily know what to expect from fast travel games? Uh, do you want to be known as a studio who who works on a certain type of genre we set our own philosophy and vision quite early on which i still think is you know we're staying true to which is we are creating fantastical worlds that you don't want to leave hmm. and the curious tale of the stolen pets is definitely that kind of world building game where your the immersion is key and the sense of wonder is key and the the you know i don't want to leave this feeling is key we're also focusing a lot on story and characters and even though the curious tale is a, uh, a whole different kind of game than apex construct it's still focusing very much on characters and story i would say all the pets have you know amazing personalities and are super cute of course <laughs> very cute, very uh, but you also have some uh, you know human uh, characters in the game and we're actually telling a story in the game about your childhood and the broken relationship with your sister and the grandfather you know narrative over your adventures that you used to do and maybe you know we hope that the player may find some things out about themselves that they hadn't thought about uh, for decades so yes it's a very different game and yes it's a kind of a risk i would say it's not our purpose to position ourselves as a surprise studio <laughs> that's that's not why we did the, the curious tale it really just started with an awesome game idea from our uh, senior animator James Hunt back in November, December last year when he basically pitched this vision he had for a really cool VR game to us. And we we all just like, we have to do this game. It's, it's too good of an idea to pass up on. And it really fits with our core pillars as a studio. So it is definitely an experimental project. It's a passion project and it's a smaller team. I mean, they started out two 
two people working on the game. Wow. And uh, now t- towards the end, eight people have been involved, but it's still just half of the studio. So we all, but we really want to be that kind of studio as well, because we don't know everything about VR today. We don't know exactly what to work. We, we don't want to be doing Apex Construct 2, 3, and 4, you know, only. There is much more to learn and experiment with in VR. And this idea of having miniature worlds in VR that you could actually you know, lean into and move around or, you know, you know, just interact with, engage with. That was a cool of a concept to not make. So we put our full support behind it and uh, it's been a heartwarming passion project since then. Yeah, and I suppose it'd be good to kind of learn a bit more about the game uh, and sort of like how it plays yeah. differently to Apex. What are the main differences, apart from obviously the, the major aesthetical differences? Well, tell us a bit about the game, what to expect and how it plays. So... Uh, Apex Construct, we, we, we're quite proud of most of the things that we made with that game. We believe it's really polished now and it's, it's a great experience in itself. But it's also you know, a first-person action adventure that requires some learning to enjoy. Hmm. There's a settings menu that we have over 30 different options to cater for locomotion and for people not to feel nausea, for turning... All those kind of things. Mm. So one of the reasons we made The Curious Tale of the Stolen Pets was to make a game that would be accessible for anyone. That you could intuitively start playing, just basically just using your intuition, head straight into it and then enjoy it. So in the game, there's this narrative tale about your, your, your grandfather speaks to you in a dream and then he takes you back to your childhood imaginative worlds or adventures that you used to create with him. You have small miniature worlds like dioramas in front of you and they're all filled with a, you know, a lot of details and life and colors. Uh, it's just a you know, fantastic, fantastic world to look at. This, 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 you know. And then in these worlds, for some reason, which you, you don't know from the begin with, to begin with, the pets have gone missing. And it's your task to interact with the world, to spin them, to lift things and grab things and in, you know, just engage with all the interactive elements and then to find these uh, hidden animals. So you have some puzzles in the game. Uh, it's not a hardcore puzzle game. It's more of an interactive tale, but some of the puzzles absolutely require you to think creative. Like in the first world, there's a chain puzzle consisting of a tea kettle and a teacup and a clock and some leaves. And you have to you know, try things out just to understand how everything fits. And then eventually, hopefully, you'll find one animal. Hmm. And as you find more animals, the game takes you through different diorama worlds with more puzzles and more animals to find. So it takes you from the summer cottage to the winter vacation world to a to sort of a beach house uh, where you can go underwater and then you get to the prehistoric world. So and we have spent so much time on the on every little detail in the game. Uh, and you can interact with anything. You point to the characters and they will reply to you somehow and you, you know you can push shake the tree and then leaves come down or it's just it's just a game to be fully immersed at your own pace there is no stress or time limit or fail states uh, i think it's a perfect introductory game for people who want to showcase vr to other players or just embark on a journey themselves and being taken through the game learning more about your relationship with your sister and the grandfather and maybe even revealing something in the end if you find all the animals so it's um, yeah we, we couldn't be prouder and it's mm. coming out now in the, in less than two weeks. So it's so exciting, and uh, I feel like for the way you've approached Curious Tales, as you I, I sort of mentioned earlier on about introducing people to VR, and I feel like you've really touched upon that there, mentioning how it's a good introductory game. And with the creation of like figurines, you, you've teased the box on social media recently, which I, I won't ask you to tell me what's in the box, <laughs> but um, it seems like you're really sculpting a new kind of brand with Curious Tales, uh, looking at a wider marketing strategy to really create something lasting for VR and again an introductory point for people to really jump on uh, so what is the different marketing approach what sort of differences have you done marketing wise to appeal to people with Curious Tales compared to Apex Construct well to start with we didn't have any marketing budget for the Curious Tale <laughs> <laughs> but of course it's um it is a game that we realize will come to its its own rights when being enjoyed. That's so. So we had to bring it to Gamescom, for example, this summer, and we have had now a couple of content creators being able to play it on their channels as well. Because it's it's really a game that when you play it, that sense of wonder mm. and uh, you know 
just being immersed in those worlds, it's something that you can't really put on, on paper. You can't really put it in text, which again goes back to what you said about VR before. Maybe this is a time where we are, I wouldn't say struggling, but yeah. it's definitely a challenge to convince people about the values of the Curious Tale before they've tried it. But I do think what part of what we did was to say, let's, let's, let's make sure that the artistic aspects of the game comes out Mm. So quite early on, we made a an agreement with uh, a Swedish genius called, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but it's called Wintergatan. Yes, I saw you mention that, yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, we felt that let's make something of the music in the game because music and the audio in the game is something really spectacular as well. I'm happy to say that Wintergatan has put their full support behind the Curious Tale and we now have their music featured in the game, wow, which is amazing. So for those of you who don't know Wintergatan, he's the creator of uh, the Marble Machine, which is basically a musical instrument that consists of 2,000 marbles. I think the, <laughs> when I checked yesterday, 117 million and views on YouTube on his first initial video wow. where he basically starts the a big wooden machine and out comes amazing music just by marbles you know moving around in the machine and hitting each other so uh, and then of course Gosh. yeah there's a band as well that, that makes music. So it's not only the Marble Machine, but Wintergatan is really genius. And I'm so happy to have their music in the game. Uh, so we did that. And then, of course, we applied and actually ended up winning the Best Immersive Game Award at Rain Dance Film Festival. That's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And that, honestly, I know that everyone says this, but it really came as a surprise to us because we went up against quite strong competitors in our award category. We we had you know no man's sky and the doctor who for example uh, in the same category <laughs> <Definitely> stiff <competition. laughs> yeah yeah so i went to london to the award ceremony and i i did not expect to return back to sweden with the golden r but we did and uh, you know that's the thing that every time we have brought a curious tale to people new people who play it they all leave with that sense of wonder and amazement like they're so happy and they keep smiling and they laugh when they play so it kind of the insight kind of grew me that maybe maybe we'll actually have a chance here because it's our product is something really unique i love doctor who and no man's sky of course goes without saying it's it's quite a popular game yeah. uh but the curious tale the curious tale is, is really something unique and just getting that recognition to sort of position the curious tale as a more of an interactive tale with you know, you know movie like values yeah so to speak that was also key for us in the go to market plan so it's this yeah it's a very different campaign than apex construct i would say but it's also hard to compare because apex construct was our first game we relied a lot on first party to promote our game now with this game Again, you know, I'm super happy with the support that we're getting from PlayStation and Oculus, and they're really embracing this title, HTC, Steam, and all that. So I think we have a pretty good chance, to your point, to see Curious Tale grow into something more than we initially had planned for. And hopefully, with time, this can be a franchise in VR that we can expand on and make, you know, potentially make a, a sequel. Who knows? Even merchandise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think you've already started on the merchandise front. And, yeah, a little bit. Uh, just yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> that's great. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's the cool thing is that it, it's already inspiring you to try new things, uh, perhaps that you didn't with Apex Construct. And I think that's the exciting thing about Curious Tales is that it's so, it, it's breeding a kind of new approach to, to, to marketing your product. Mm. And I suppose the, the one thing I do, the one question I do have is obviously, the game is pushing I would argue it's a younger demographic than Apex Construct but with health warnings about children using headsets still fairly prominent mm -hmm. uh, like PlayStation for instance have still got like a 12 age rating on theirs which you know is it, whereas we have seen children much younger and there are games advertised at a younger age than that yep. do you feel the conversation is changing uh, with VR at the moment being more open to all, all audiences uh, and then following on from that point what are your sort of personal hopes and aims for Curious Tale and indeed the future of VR. I, I mean, personally, first and foremost, I, I wholeheartedly respect the uh, age recommendations that are established now by platform owners. And uh, it's really up to any, any adult to
to listen to them or or not. The Curious Tale is absolutely a game that I think have, I wouldn't say a younger uh, audience in Apex Construct, but maybe a, a different one, because mm-hmm. we've seen a lot of like middle-aged to older people enjoy the game a lot. Yeah. Uh, my daughters of five and seven have played it a lot, the early version, and they think that that is game is the best game ever made. <laughs> that's, all, so, that's all the recommendation you need. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They're not biased at all. So... <laughs> But maybe it's changing, and I'm, I think going back again to the ease of use and the accessibility of VR. When in the early days you had to have a power horse computer and you had to have external cameras set up and you had to do a lot of calibration with your cameras and your play area, your guardian settings or whatever, it meant that the player had to be really dedicated to play VR. And it wasn't just a thing that younger people or you know non-gamers or older people would try or jump into it was too complicated really now it's not that complicated anymore so i absolutely think we will see more kids play vr i'm not saying if it's a good or bad thing but i think that will happen and you know potentially non more more non-core gamers as well engage with vr and uh, yeah there's a lot of comments you know on 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 uh, online right now about the curious tale when when people see a video or a gameplay from the game and they say oh this looks perfect for my kids <laughs> which you know is is totally fine but i do think the the quite serious and nostalgic tale in a game and a sense of wonder in the game and the level of detail in the game it's something that should relate to everyone who who wants to feel immersed regardless of age or, or gaming preferences yeah. well i mean i feel like it's, you've got two fantastic games uh upcoming here they both look incredible for different reasons and obviously this has been a really really interesting to chat to you and, and get your insight onto the different aspects of vr and also the development of these games and uh, really appreciate the discussion and uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me and answer my questions of course it's great fun uh so we do have a couple of fan questions if you do have some time so if uh, there's just a couple of them some of them are going to band together because they relate to very similar things which I think you might be able to preempt what some people have been asking mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a question here from Fabian Dirksen who says he's really looking forward to the curious tale of the stolen pets <laughs> uh, how did you come up with the idea for it and did you know from the start what sort of game it was going to be we did know from the start that it was going to be a game where you had a small miniature worlds in front of you that was the core idea And I think I mentioned it before, but it was last winter that our senior animator, who's a very creative guy, James Hunt, uh, came to us with this game idea, basically. He felt uh, he's a a massive fan of of games like uh, Machinima or Treasure Toad Tracker Mm. as well. So that kind of inspiration for him to saying the sense of scope that you can get in VR is amazing. And I haven't yet seen... There are some games out there, of course, who, who plays with the God mode view, where you see the world in front of you. I mean, and, and of course, third person as well. But there hasn't been a game yet, he felt, that takes a full world and then just lets you play with it in front of you. So that was the core idea. But then I think what happened over time was that we added a layer of narrative to the game, rather than just being a game where you solve some light puzzles and interact with a lot of elements or and create chain events. We added a layer of, um, of narrative to it and a story, which fit perfectly once added. We realized that while the game is very colorful and light and inviting and cute, what if we add some sentimental a more serious backstory to it as well that was a really really nice mix i think that just fit perfectly and it all fits so well together with the music now the grandfather's voice the cuteness of the animals the childhood memories it's just yeah it it all came came down it, it became one complete package in time that's yeah it's a great point and uh, it, it's it's i can see how it's come from the conceptual stage and really grown into something much bigger it's uh, really really excited to uh, to get to play that and that's a great question thank you for asking that fabian jimsa 71 asks what vr game have you played that made you think damn i wish we'd made that Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, Is there any? Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Is there any? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's probably more flat screen games that I felt like, oh, I want to make this in VR yeah. ra- rather than looking at 
you know competitors game releases. I I I got to play um, Phantom Covert Ops. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at at Gamescom, for example, and yeah, it's just brilliant idea of putting someone in a cage arc and you can sit down and play VR throughout the game, which is like I usually stand up when I play, which means I get tired in my back <laughs> after some time, <laughs> and I hate sitting down because I'm I'm missing out on immersion. I think if the character in the game stands up, I want to be standing mm. up, but this character in the, this game actually sits down throughout all the experience, and I what that means I can do that without losing any immersions. And and you know the the se- the level that I played was it was brilliant. So I really look forward to Phantom Covert Ops from End Dreams, and I yeah, that's not necessarily a game that we would have made because it's it's realistic shooting and stuff in the game, but definitely an amazing game. And on the flat grid side, if we can just add that, yeah. one game that I would love to play in VR is uh, Firewatch. Oh yes, yeah. By far, by far the most, my most requested VR port. <laughs> yeah. If that ever happens, and and yeah, it's 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 a game that could absolutely be made by fast travel games, you know, because it's such a focus on immersion and world and and story and and characters. So. Oh, that game had me in bits. I remember, I remember, I sat down one evening, just played it from start to finish that game had me an absolute bit yeah. I, I loved it, it, it you're absolutely right it, it's a perfect vr game there's no reason why it couldn't make that jump uh i hope campo sandu sometimes sometimes actually think about yeah it, it is it is beautiful game so i'm gonna sort of pull the last questions together because they all relate to one very familiar theme uh, yeah. So we've got questions from VR Martin, that guy as well, Bozoid and Midlife Game Isk, who ask, do you hope to work with the f- world of Apex Construct again in the future? Uh, they went with Bow and Apex. How about a boomerang in their next secret game? <laughs> uh, you know, we really love the layout of Apex. So hopefully your next scene will have a bow and arrow too. <laughs> Um, I think all of us at Fast Travel Games feel that we are not just done with Apex Construct. We're not, we're not done with it. Because as much as we're proud of the game, we have a lot of ideas on how to improve upon it and uh, how to expand on the concept of, of Apex Construct. So I think at some point, I hope at least, that we will get back to it. From my perspective, it's too good of a foundation not to do something else something more with, with Apex Construct. That said, though, we do have something pretty exciting in plans for the future beyond uh, Bodycast 2 and The Curious Tale. And uh, mm. it might not be Apex Construct 2, per se, but what we will definitely do is to take all the learnings and all the good parts about Apex Construct and Body Cuts 2 and Curious Tale and put all of this into an amazing game that I yeah, can't wait to talk about, but it, it'll still be some time before we do so. So that was a long answer, but I, you know, yes, I, I really hope we will make more Apex Construct games in the future at some point. And not Apex Legends games, don't forget that distinction. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. It's the same, you know. So. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the answering those questions. I really appreciate them. Thank you so much, Andreas, for taking the time to answer that that is going to do it for today's show thank you so much for everyone for tuning in a massive thank you to our special guests uh tell everyone where they can find you andreas and anything else you might like to share before we close out today yeah sure so look us up on uh, either fasttravelgames.com or if you want to follow us on uh, twitter facebook and instagram it's just at fast travel games it's really simple so stay updated there and uh, we will have some pretty exciting information about these two games and what lies ahead very soon so thanks for having me it's been a blast no problem at all this has been really really fun uh so if you've got any other questions you want to answer during a future show reply in the comment section below or send us a message on your preferred social platform and we'll do our best to answer them what would you like to see in future podcasts sound up below in the comment sections we're looking to make this a show that's as informative and interesting to you as possible you can find put games on facebook tweet us at put games subscribe on youtube using the link in the description below you can also find us on discord instagram linkedin and get all the latest news on our products on perpgames.com including the apex contract no less thanks for listening in and we'll see you next time